Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship at Meadowbrook Congregational Church on this second Sunday of Easter. My name is Pastor Joel Boyd, and I'm blessed to serve this congregation and all of its members and friends. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us here in person today or joining us online. We're glad to have you with us. If you're joining us online, feel free to download and uh, join us with the bulletin you have just above your feed in Facebook Live. Friends, all are welcome to attend the annual meeting of the Southeast Michigan Association of Congregational Churches this afternoon at 3 p.m. at Mount Hope Congregational Church in Livonia. I'll be attending. You can attend either in person or virtually. If you're interested, please see me after service. And friends, if you know of anyone or if you are that someone who are interested in joining our church or learning more about what it means to be a Congregationalist, well, you're invited to attend our upcoming new member and intro to Congregationalism class discussion, uh, which will be held on Tuesday, May 17th at 6.30 p.m. We'll be meeting here uh, in the Fellowship Hall at 6.30 p.m. in person, but if you'd like to join us online, please feel free to contact me, the church office. We can certainly arrange to do that via Zoom as well on that evening. And for all those who would like to join at that time, we'll be holding a membership ceremony on Sunday during service on May 22nd. So please feel free to see with me, see me with any questions about that. Well, coming up soon, folks, we're hosting a blood drive here at our church on Wednesday, May 4th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. through uh, American Red Cross. This will be in our fellowship hall. You can go online to redcrossblood.org to sign up using the sponsor code Meadowbrook to schedule your appointment. Uh, Carol Riddell is, uh, is here. We'll schedule appointments in the fellowship hall after service. So if you have any questions about that, you can feel free to see Carol after service. Uh, your blood donation helps save lives, and it takes approximately an hour of your time on that day. One of the other interesting things to note about our blood drive at this time is that during the routine of blood screening, uh, your blood will be screened for COVID-19 antibodies, uh, which can be extra help to compromise patients. Uh, so this may also provide insight into your own COVID-19 uh, antibody status. So if you want to check that out too, you can, you can get that info as well. Uh, so along with uh, many safety protocols, masks will be required uh, for your donation. So just keep that in mind. Well, friends, we have one change to our bulletin this morning. Our sending hymn is 195, uh, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, not 196. So 195, unless you want to sing an interesting solo. So I think you should join us on 195. Well, friends, we'll be honoring our graduates this year, uh, coming up during service on May 8th. Uh, so if you know of anyone or you are the person who's graduating, either from kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or anything you're graduating from, please contact us at the office by May 4th. We'd, even if you can't be with us that day, we'd love to uh, honor you and your celebration for your graduation at that time. And uh, on, also on that special day, friends, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a celebration of Mother's Day when we treat our moms, grandmothers, and mother figures in our lives to a special time of recognition. Everyone's invited to join us for service on that day as we offer our gratitude for all our moms and all that they do so they know they're loved and appreciated. Well, friends, at this time, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of our Lord. Please rise and join me in the call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
for his steadfast love endures forever. Please join with me in the invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we praise you. We praise you in this your sanctuary. We praise you in your mighty firmament. We praise you for your mighty deeds. We praise you according to your surpassing greatness. Bless us by your awesome presence, O God, and remind us to be the people you call us to be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel message of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Okay, is there anyone else that would like to come forward? Okay, I think it's just us then. All right, oh, Don, thanks. Okay, so a few weeks ago, or a couple of weeks ago, we put together plastic eggs. We put things in them. Oh, you can't do it yet, because I have an order, which I've already forgotten. Hopefully I can remember. Okay, so we put together plastic eggs, and we put little things in them to remind us of different stories from Holy Week, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a pop quiz. Open that up and see what's in it. Okay. You remember? Palm. Palm. From? Thank you, Clara. They were whispering it. Okay. I'll put that one in. i got to remember the next one. Oh. Then. Okay, open it up. If you remember, what is that? And that's to remind us of the Last Supper. You got it. Okay, put it back in here. You want to do that one for John? Okay. This one's a tough one. I don't know if you'll remember. What do you have? A rock or a stone. Where does a stone come in? Yeah. Yeah. 
the women go and they're worried about the stone in front of, well, they put the stone in front of the tomb on Friday, on Good Friday, and it's gone on Easter. All right, and then, do you remember the last egg? What's going to be in the last egg, Clara? Very good. You guys are so good. All right, so we left that last the rock is the loudest. The bread sticks to the side, I noticed. Okay, so let's see. We left that last egg empty. That's the Easter story. The tomb was empty. And Easter is a time for us to rejoice and celebrate the good news that God raised Jesus and gave us new life. So the women on that morning, they were probably pretty sad and scared to go see Jesus' body and take care of it. But when they got there and found the tomb empty... And the angel talked to them. What did the angel say? Do not be afraid. I love when they say that. And the, what did he say about Jesus? He is risen. Very good. So, in Sunday school today, we are going to do an activity where we share the good news with other people. But before we do that, we're going to pray. And so Claire is going to actually, or do you want to do it, John? John's going to do it? Okay. So there's a little bit of instruction. So you ready? When, when John says at the end of each line, Christ is risen, this is kind of what we did last week too. We're going to say, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. You got that? Yeah. Okay. So John, you might want to do one practice. Say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Okay. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Yes. Dear God. Thank you for bringing us today, together today. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thank you for sending us Jesus. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thank you for telling us the good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Help us to share the good news with others. Christ is risen. Amen. Well, sisters and brothers, let us now take a time to raise the prayers of our innermost hearts to the Lord as we pray in a moment of silence. Lord God, you are with us in the silence. You are with your people in all the joyful noise of the world around us. And Lord, you bless all your creation by your great love. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and be present to all their needs. Lord, we pray for Cindy Coppin and family as her niece passed away after her battle with cancer. We continue to pray for Beverly Dudley as she heals from a recent back surgery. Lord, we pray for Vicki Wanakant and her recovery from a recent procedure and give thanks that she has been feeling better and is able to join us here today in worship. Lord, we pray for Barb Boyle Patty Hokett's sister, as Barb recovers from a surgery uh, this last week. We pray for Mary Crockett as she recovers from a recent fall, Lord. We continue to pray for all your people in Ukraine, 
uh, that they may be blessed, that you may bring them to safety uh, and to bless all those who are helping them, uh, be they from afar or even in neighboring countries or within uh, all the challenges they're facing right now uh, in their home country, Lord. Lord, we pray for Donna Brown as she recovers uh, from a recent fall. Lord God, we raise all these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, the offering for the work of this church will now be received.
Let us pray. Loving, giving God, Lord, all that we have comes from you. Bless these our gifts, Lord, that they may be a blessing to all your people, to all your world, to further your will uh, through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, now may the Lord God open our hearts and our minds as we witness to the word in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, we have been made a serving kingdom, a priestly kingdom, by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We hear it in the Gospels, and we see it here in Revelation. Yet the book of Revelation is a mysterious biblical text for all of those who have tried to wade through its pages and interesting imagery. Curiously, this has often led it to its either being solely focused on or wholly neglected, given the circumstance. Some preachers, you'll notice, they seem to kind of tend to live in the book. Others may hide from it. So vast and stunning are its images and potential implications that it can be easily, really a worrisome, daunting task simply to try to make heads or tails of it. Especially if we are approaching it with any attempt to, to take uh, something face value or, or a literal teaching from it, uh, even at a quick glance. Even when we think of all the, the dragon and uh, interesting imagery like that. Yet I would encourage us to enter into this rich text with faith, bringing into it our experience with the rest of the biblical canon, all the other books of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, and the entirety of the New Testament outside of this final book, that is. Now, as we dig in here, it may be helpful to recall a couple things about the genre of this curious book. Kind of what kind of a book is it? Right? When we read for our fun, uh, we may read fiction books, different kinds of nonfiction, maybe a biography, maybe a memoir, maybe we like poetry, maybe we write some of these types of genres ourselves. Now, while we have great experience with a lot of the histories, the poems, and even prayers, right, the Psalms are, are prayers of the Old Testament, and while we have witnessed the books of prophecy, and wisdom alongside the narratives of the Gospels and letters of Paul, or even those of the Johannine community, right, the letters of John. Well, nowhere else in the Bible do we find such a curious combination of literary genre as we do here in Revelation. There are a lot of things going on, sometimes at the same time. 
Perhaps first we should remember that its title is Revelation, singular, and not the commonly misunderstood revelations. One revelation with a lot of things going on. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, or as the Greek would have it. But if we look at the original Greek, Apocalypsis Jesu Christu. So specifically, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ is what the Greek refers to as what this book's title is. So it's here at the very beginning of the text itself that we get a little bit of a picture of its genre, what kind of book it says it is, an apocalypse of Jesus. So it's an apocalypse. Apocalyptic literature was popular during this time period when this was written and ranging a couple centuries even earlier. The book of Daniel is representative of this genre, if you've ever read Daniel, as are several non-canonical Jewish apocalypses, right? Things that didn't make it into the Bible canon, but you may have heard of them, right? Some, some books called First Enoch or Second Baruch, these are not books we typically focus on in Sunday school. <laughs> So that's okay if you haven't heard of them. There are examples of this, this genre, right? With high symbolism, end time depictions, like what will happen at the end of all time, often delivered by an angel of God. And this is a real interesting one. Mostly directed at an audience of people who are currently suffering from great persecution or oppression. That's who the book is written to. Kind of interesting, right? So here in this case, with, uh, with what we have with something with the book of Daniel as an example, right? the revelation, the apocalyptic, being aimed towards people who are suffering uh, persecution under, well, you don't have to remember this name, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Right? There was Epiphanes I, so. During the times of the book of Daniel, okay? So this was a, this was a tyrant, persecuting people. This book, Daniel's written to them specifically, speaks to all people in all time, but written to them to give them hope that they will make it through this. Kind of interesting. Read that book sometimes and picture hearing it as somebody suffering through some really hard stuff. Picture being somebody in Ukraine right now and somebody writing this to you. Some suggest that Revelation may have been written during the persecution under the emperor Nero. Now, there's somebody we've heard of, not a nice guy, right? Or even another Roman emperor around that time. Sometimes the scholars have a little bit of float of some of this time. Certainly, it speaks to the oppression of God's people by a worldly empire, something that people in the world are trying to make people do against their will, right? Not good stuff. Perhaps this focus on the persecuted may also help to explain the need for such symbolism and coded language given the real threat of danger by those who are suffering. It's kind of nice to be able to mention something about an angel or a dragon when somebody else is overhearing the conversation. This also points us towards the important role apocalyptic has to play in encouraging hope in the hearts of the oppressed people of any time period. Revelation reminds those who suffer now that in the end, all things will be made right in Jesus, the Lamb of God. It doesn't say the suffering is not happening. It says it will happen in the end, in Jesus. It leads us through our present pain in hopefulness, right, in hopefulness for the coming deliverance and the coming ultimate justice of God. I'm going to say more about that later, the justice of God. So Revelation is an apocalypse. It's also a prophecy. Even a cursory glance at the various images of the future reveal the prophetic nature of this great book. But when we dig deeper, we see how richly embedded are references to the Old and New Testaments all over the place, incorporating God's historical truth, right? Thing that people, people have done these things in biblical history, in fulfilled promises, in pointing us towards how God will continue and is actually in the process of now fulfilling promises for the faithful moving forward. That's kind of cool. It connects everything that has been with what is happening now and will to come. It's 
sounds familiar to some of the words we heard already. So Revelation is an apocalypse. It is a prophecy. It is also a letter. <laughs> I don't know how many apocalyptic, you know, prophetic letters you've written to people, but this, there's a lot going on here. So it helps to think about them a little bit before we look at it together. So it's a letter, not quite the same type of letter as Paul, the apostle Paul wrote, or the letters of John the Elder, right? The letters of John. But Revelation is a letter in that it is addressed specifically to seven churches in Asia and to the church universal, including the original context as well as to people in our church today. Now we have to remind ourselves Asia at that time typically is including areas expanded around the Middle East to the east a little bit, to the north, to the west, not typically understood. Scholarly is you know, Thailand or China. It could be, it could be speaking to anybody, but, but they're talking about this broader region and these specific churches. So as apocalypse, prophecy, and letter, revelation is a bit of a sight to behold. And it's interesting as a challenge to engage it and to say, I know exactly what that means. <laughs> There's a lot going on. And we do so modestly, right? And with open hearts, not really where we think it should be going, but where the Spirit is leading us to see where it's going, where it has been going, where it's going right now and where it's leading us. So we return now to our specific passage, right? Revelation 1, right at the beginning, verses 4 through 8. Not many verses and still a lot going on. The opening of the letter to the seven churches, note none of whom have even been named yet. Though we soon learn they're all based in kind of an eastern part of what modern-day Turkey is. Right? This is aimed, this is where we see the letter to these churches. Well, John of Patmos, right? a, lot of, a lot of scholars will argue that that is the, letter, you know, the, the author of the church. Some people consider it the same John, the apostle John. Right? If we accept him to be the author, John reports his vision here in this letter to the people of God who are suffering. That's what we hear about at the beginning of this letter. In so doing, John starts by combining the traditional Hellenistic, or Greek, or the traditional Greek greeting, charis, which means, you know, grace, charis, with the Jewish greeting, shalom, peace. He puts those together, offering God's persecuted people blessings of grace and peace. You see that translated in many of our uh, Pauline letters, right? Grace and peace to you, to the church. Charis and shalom for all God's people. Yet this otherwise typical opening for a letter also includes the extension of blessings from the triune God, right? From the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. An amazing thing for John to convey. Right? One thing for you to say, blessings to you. I hope you're doing well. God also hopes you're well. <laughs> so we're hearing a lot going on here. An amazing thing for John to convey. But here is where we meet the assurance of God's promise that God will indeed come to take care of us. For God is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Oh, and I really like this part. It's very nerdy for all the people like the nerdy things. The literal Greek says there, the one who is coming. You see how different that is? That's not somebody who's going to come. It's somebody who's in the process of coming, always. It's something that's happening. God is coming through Jesus, always. This as opposed to what we might think of, of a far-off future, right? We say, oh, that doesn't concern me. Something that may not inspire as strong of a sense of hope, especially in the people who are suffering a lot now. Kind of hard to picture something happening a very, very, very long time from now, if you're in a hard place right now. Yet there are many ways one can interpret this end times prophecy, as I'm sure is not a surprise to you, given all the genres. Whole schools of thought address timing and the how, if at all, we participate in it. Some whole denominations or categories of systems of thought I won't get into all of those, but you could look that up and you could have a great discussion with me if you want over coffee someday. 
But, but you'll kind of read through the lines here of kind of how I see my version anyway of where we are in the participation of that. But right? in our church, you're encouraged to see where, where do you see that we fit in there together? What do you think about that? Where do you see the Spirit leading you and leading us together? So as, as followers of the risen Christ, right, we just celebrated the, the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. Uh, we, we continue to remind ourselves of that. I had a pastoral colleague um, he, one of his favorite things to do was to keep singing Easter songs. You know, sometimes we like to sing Christmas songs in the summer. <laughs> um, we don't always sing Easter songs, but in a way, Easter is always who we are. We are always people in the light of Jesus' resurrection. So as followers of the risen Christ, we recall his love commandment. Right? We focus on this on Monday, Thursday, when he tells his followers, us too, that we will be known, will be known to be his disciples. People essentially will know we're Christians if they love one another as he has loved them. That's the trick, as he has loved us. That's pretty hard. So we ask ourselves a lot of questions about what that looks like. We will be known to be Christians, right, by actively loving one another. Not simply by saying things, or showing up when, you know, when we want to, or convenient schedules, or, or whatever we have in, in, in our modern world, but by doing faithful things as part of our identity, as part of who we are, what it means to be us. Yet we're not really talking about salvation only here, right? I mean, that's part of it, but we're, we're, also, we're talking about the response to our faith as a called, as a sent people? What does that look like to be those people every day? In Revelation, John extends blessings from an ever-present, intervening God. But he also extends the blessings of Jesus, the faithful witness, or martyr, is what the Greek shows us. There's a big word. If you want to look up that one to see what, what kind of history we have in that word. So this Jesus is not only faithful, but is the firstborn of the dead resurrected to life. Yet a life that is vastly different and distinct from our average human life. For Jesus was resurrected and then ascended to heaven to be with the Father. We see this soon in, in you know, our order, the liturgy of, of the church calendar, the ascension. This is a unique first. John shows us how Jesus is also the ruler over all the kings of the earth. Jesus is Lord, is sovereign, and reigns supreme over all things in the world. And just think for a moment what that would mean to people who are persecuted, who are enslaved, who are losing their country, who have no agency, no power. What it means for them to hear that Jesus rules over all the people that are not really letting them do anything. Well, while we may try to get <laughs> things right in the world as best we can, we, we, we do so without, when we do so without considering how God is part of this, it, it's very easy for us to go off course, even by accident in a way. Uh, and in many ways, we kind of chase our tail back through the same old challenges we've had uh, for, for as long as we can remember. And certainly, we see these pictures of this in, in Scripture, how we've tried to do things only for ourselves, only for the people we like, only for this group, not for that group, for this amount of land, to not let people be there, all kinds of things throughout our history as people. Be it self-inflicted, or even through our, our, our tacit endorsement, maybe not even paying attention, right? Either individually or collectively through oppressive systems, governments, structures, different things. We see this in our present history. We see it in, in, in recent history. We see it in biblical history. And the apocalyptic that these were written to people, you know, undergoing different things under an emperor, even. We read about them. We see their statues in the DIA now, but we don't normally think about what it's like to live under an emperor. But with Jesus, it's an entirely different story. Seeing Jesus as the Lord over all things, 
as the ruler by his great mercy and love, well, that points us to a great hope, a great hope through our pain. It doesn't say it's not there. It's a hope through our pain. It's with us. For we know that God fulfills God's promises and that in Jesus, God the Father promises to end all suffering, pain, and even death itself. We see this in Revelation. Even death itself. So John extends blessings from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, and then, well then, will we have kind of a curious passage pointing us towards the seven spirits before God's throne. Well, what some scholars suggest is the sevenfold spirit we see actually in the book of, Eli um, a book of Isaiah as the Holy Spirit. That's kind of interesting. We're going way back to, to prophecy we've already had. Jewish texts suggest even seven uh, archangels being before God's throne. While we might also consider the importance of the number seven itself, if you've ever done a study of this, in scripture, the number seven often refers to completion or to wholeness or to things being perfect. Revelation contains several references to the number seven. Perhaps regardless of how we take the meaning of the sevenfold spirit, we may still see it as pointing towards God, be it in the Holy Spirit as God, or in how God's angels, those who do God's work faithfully, achieve God's will in the world. That number seven is really big. Yet we remember that other scary number we have, right? We never want, to see, we never want our address to be in three sixes, right? And we see it on a movie, ah, right? The idea behind that being it's so close to being the perfect number, but very much not. It's not there. Almost like it's trying to act like it is, but it's not. It's pointing away. Following this opening greeting, John directs our attention to Jesus. Again, raising Jesus' status before us, the readers. Perhaps foreshadowing how all things are achieved through Jesus. Kind of what we see along the lines of the beginning of the Gospel of John. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, John says. We are aiming our hearts to Jesus, our Savior, our triumphant Lord, the one who is in the process of delivering us, right, has also made us to be a kingdom. Made us to be something. Right? Made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, or serving his God and Father. For that, after all, is what priests do, and what we'd see priests do in Scripture. And of course, in, in congregationalism and in many understandings, as we see in, in, in the church universal, as priesthood of all believers, well, maybe we see how John is pointing us towards how we all are serving God as God's kingdom. We're all part of that kingdom. We're all participating in that service. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Jesus is coming. And all witness it, John writes. Again, here we have a prophecy and apocalyptic as part of a letter to the church. So John is sending us a message, right? Even if written specifically to a persecuted people in time, he still, that message still speaks to us in the church. And we think to ourselves, what if we were to get something like this today? Maybe at that time, it's a letter, it's prophecy, it's apocalyptic. Maybe we got something today through all the different media we have today, through a conversation, through a text, through some kind of video call. God is working through all of these to connect to people. And often to people that are having a really hard time to remind them that they will be okay. So John is sending us a message 
But regardless of the genre, we can still dig deep into what God is revealing, where God is writing us, where God is writing us into the story, into the story. And how in Christ, as his serving priestly kingdom, we are called to love actively. It's something we do. And this love may look different now than it did in the early church or to the people who received these apocalyptic writings. It probably will look different. This love serves God in being present to the child who wonders at the many empty bottles of booze on the kitchen counter each morning. It speaks to that child. It serves God in being present to the laid-off 61-year-old woman who does not know where she fits into a changing workforce, perhaps something now, a post-COVID economy as it emerges. Unprepared feeling, maybe, as to where skills connect to what comes next. It speaks to her. This love serves God in being present to any group of people who may look or behave differently than we do, even in our own region but who have for some reason or other been kept on the outside of society and unwelcomed by thought or deed. This love, this love is incarnational. It's relational, relevant, and it's missional. It's who we are, and it's whose we are. No doubt there are many who suffer in our own midst, in our church, in our friends with us online, in your friends and family who may live elsewhere around the world. And God knows us and God wants us to know that we're called to participate into that plan, to love into those challenges, that suffering, anything that's causing that suffering, and to serve as God would have us into God's coming kingdom in Jesus. God knows our pain, and God knows that it will, a time will come that it will end. For God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. So may we listen and respond when we receive our call from God, that by the Spirit we may be a serving kingdom, giving the most precious offering we have, our whole lives, to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit may be. Amen. Well, friends, please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing our sending hymn number 195. Remember, unless you want that solo, it's 195. Jesus Christ is risen today.
The prophet Isaiah tells us what we know in our heart. How a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. People of God, we have seen this root of Jesse in our hearts, our risen Savior, Christ Jesus. So let us go as the Spirit leads us to love and serve into his coming kingdom to the glory of God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Go now to love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen.